Hi, all. Here we are now for our first topic in CHY 107. Uh, and so let's go ahead and without further ado, let's just go ahead and dive in. And so just a couple of questions to, to get us thinking about things. And so when we think about human physiology, nutrition, health and disease, what science do you think is really most important in understanding those things? Then a follow up to that, how many of you know what chemical element is actually responsible for transporting oxygen within our bloodstreams? So hopefully you were able to answer number one, it's the reason why you're in this class, in that, oh, there we go, chemistry. And, and chemistry is often called the central science because it really relates to almost most every aspect of our lives, especially though when, when it comes to health and wellness. And so that's why you are all in this course, Chemistry for the Health Sciences, because really what we're going to try to do here, or what we will do, is to provide you with enough chemistry background knowledge to be able to understand how it does play a role in, in various health professions, no matter what profession it is that you are looking to go into. They're looking through our class role here. There's a lot of nursing majors. Uh, lots of various health science majors and a few others sort of sort of mixed and scattered in there. But no matter what your actual major is, you're all looking at a health profession of some sort or the vast majority of you. And so really you have to have a, an underlying knowledge of a lot of the different chemistry going on in order to, to help aid you in your profession. Which leads us to the second question, iron is the actual element that's responsible for holding on to oxygen within our blood. Knowing exactly how iron actually works is, and how iron works as far as, uh, as transporting oxygen is essential for helping us to treat and prevent certain diseases. And to just sort of follow up on that, this is what's actually responsible here. Oops, sorry, you'll find when I'm doing these lectures, my mouse is a little touchy. So sometimes I accidentally advance when I don't want to. But anyway, we have what we, the, the hemoglobin protein here. You probably, chances are you've heard that term hemoglobin. Hemoglobins are made up of several different heme groups, four different heme groups. And so this is all a protein right here, made up of beta chains and alpha chains, all things that we're going to learn about as the semester goes on. And then in the center of each of these is a heme group. And in that heme group is an iron atom. And that iron atom is what actually binds to the oxygen. And so the, the iron atom is at the center of this whole thing and actually binds to the oxygen molecule. But it's the hemoglobin, this whole large, huge hemoglobin protein is, is where that all ends up taking place. And so those are things that, 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 are, that are maybe useful to know. Again, say maybe you're a nursing major and you're working with a patient and they have low iron and they just happen to ask you, well, why is iron important? You know, I know, I know that I need it, but why? You're able to answer that question for them now. Another thing that's very helpful is this is, is a very typical chem, uh, chem panel that might be taken in as part of some routine testing if you're in the hospital. And so, and, and again, I point to nursing majors a lot throughout this course uh, because typically the nursing majors are about half of, of the class rosters here. But something like this, again, very typical series of, of tests that might be done in order to try to diagnose somebody, figure out what's going on. And you wouldn't be expected to necessarily know everything involved here. But to be able to, to have a little bit of knowledge and to be able to, to talk about this a little bit with your patients, very important. Um, most of you, again, who, who are nursing majors or those of you who have just dealt with, with hospitals and nurses, you know that quite often nurses are sort of the, the, the middle people between the doctors and the patients. It, it's quite often that maybe a doctor will, will come in and explain everything and tell you what's going on. This is what's wrong with you. This is what we're going to do. And then they sweep out. And then the nurse is there. And for you to, for, for some, for a patient or for a family member to then look at and say, okay, what the heck did he just say? And then the nurse is able to explain things. And again, in order to, to explain things intelligently and to know what you're talking about, 
we really need a baseline chemical knowledge to do that. And so that's why, at least for the nursing majors, that's why you're in this course. And really the same for any other health profession. The, 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 again, we really need that, that baseline knowledge. When we look at some of the key elements in medicine, we can see them all highlighted here. We see what we call, the, for instance, some building block elements. We have what we call macronutrients, which our bodies need in, um, in a relatively larger supply. Then the micronutrients, which are in yellow, our bodies need some of these in order to um, perform various processes. But let's get a little bit more into what chemistry actually is. And so the reason that chemistry is at the heart of everything is that chemistry is the study of matter. At its very base, chemistry is the study of matter. How does matter work? And the transformations that matter can undergo. To define matter, matter is anything that has mass and takes up space, anything that has mass and volume. And so if it has mass and volume, it's matter. And so things like my little apple pencil here, obviously has mass, obviously has volume, it is matter. My post-it notes, they have mass and volume, they are matter. What do you think about the air in this room? Absolutely, it is matter. Definitely takes up space, it's taking up the whole room. And air absolutely has mass. Not much mass, but it definitely has mass. How about heat? Think about heat for a second. Heat is not matter. Heat is energy. Matter and energy are sort of two sides of the, the same coin, which we won't really get into in this course here, uh, but they're related, but they are different from each other. Something to keep in mind. Matter primarily is found in three states or phases. And these are all phases that, that you're familiar with. I mean, dating back to probably second grade science class, you learned about solids, liquids, and gases. Now, there are definitely other states of matter and other phases um, but as far as, as we're concerned, what we're going to work with, and, and really um, when we consider the, the primary types of matter that are just found naturally, these would be the three main types. And so let's look at differences on, on a chemical level. Solids have a definite shape and a definite volume. It doesn't matter what container I put my little apple pencil in here. I could put my apple pencil here into my water bottle it's still going to have the same shape. It's still going to have the same volume. That's not going to change. Liquids, on the other hand, have a definite volume. If I take one cup of water and add it into my water bottle, it's still going to be one cup. The volume is going to be the same. The shape, however, is going to change. If I have a container that's you know, fairly short, but fairly kind of fat like this, then the liquid's going to take that shape. I pour it into here, and now the liquid takes this shape, but the volume doesn't change, and that's important. Gases, on the other hand, take up the complete shape and volume of their container. Gases will always fill whatever container they are actually in. And then this just summarizes all three. Energy, as I, as I mentioned, matter and energy are closely related to each other. Energy is the ability or the capacity for something to do work. Two primary types of energy, kinetic energy or potential energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. We'll be talking about that in, in a few lectures from now as it relates to the motion of particles. When we think about just the, the particles of air, for instance, and all, how they're all moving around that, that we, we essentially interpret that as temperature. And so heat involves the motion of particles. Heat always flows from hotter to colder. Always, always, always. We'll go from, from warm to cold. That's why it's a pet peeve amongst a lot of scientists to hear somebody, you know, somebody standing there with a freezer open and somebody else says, you're letting all the cold air out. Actually, no, you're letting all the warm air in. Because heat always flows from warmer to colder. We do have to remember as well that temperature is not the same thing as heat. Temperature is, is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. So the average energy of, of all, the particular, all, all the particle motion. Whereas heat is, is a measure of the actual inherent energy. And there is a difference between those two things. 
potential energy is what's known as stored energy. So for instance, maybe a, a rock balanced up on a precipice somewhere, or you know, if, I, if I hold my alpha pencil here, it has a different potential energy than if I hold it here. Gasoline, we can think of chemical stored energy. Food is chemical stored energy. They all have a certain potential energy that can be released with the breaking of bonds. And so the chemical bonds in things like food and fuel can be thought of as stored energy. I should have showed this slide earlier, but oh, let me. Oh, I thought the link to this worked. Bear with me here. Oops, see, there goes my mouse. All right, let's see. Oh, I thought this was an actual link, but it is not. So let me bring this up because I think this is a, is a is a is a worthwhile demonstration to see. It's one of the advantages to working to teaching remotely is that I can just bring this up. If I can spell, there we go. This is a nice simulation just showing us the various states of matter. So if we look at some water molecules, here they are in the solid phase. You can see they're still moving. And that's an important note to make is that particles are always moving unless things are at absolute zero, which is something we'll talk about in a later unit. But molecules are always, always, always in motion at the molecular level. So here's a bunch of water molecules all vibrating a little bit and all moving around. They're in the solid phase. As we warm things up substantially, now we come to the liquid phase and I'll even advance that a little bit. Now we're in the liquid phase. You can see they have more energy. There's more range of motion. This is why they'll take the shape of their container because they're able to move more freely around each other. Then as we heat up even more, I'll just cheat. And then we get to the gas phase. Now they're all just randomly moving around, bouncing into each other, bouncing off the sides of the container. Um, but I like this demonstration because it really just, it, it shows us what's going on with the phases of matter down at the molecular level, which is something we're going to have to consider in this class is thinking about the, the uh, properties of matter at the molecular level. So not only is chemistry the study of matter, but it's the chemistry uh, or it's the study of the transformations of matter. And so we have to think about how matter can change. Two types of change that matter can undergo a physical change or a chemical change. The important distinction between the two is you have to think, did you make something new? Or is it the same thing just in a different form? In a physical change, the composition of the substance does not change. Water melting is a great example. It's still water. It still has the same chemical formula. It's still H2O. If I take an ice cube and I melt it, it's still H2O. We're just going from H2O solid to H2O liquid. It's a physical change. It's easily reversible. It's the other way to think of these. And that one doesn't always hold true, but it's something to consider. Whereas a chemical change, we're going to make new things with a brand new chemical formula. Cooking food. Chemical changes occur when you cook food. It's also not something that's easily reversible. So we made something brand new with new properties as well. And that's another important distinction. An example that I always love to give when I'm talking about chemical change is pure sodium metal. Is, it's a, a fairly soft solid. You can cut through it with a butter knife. Very explosive if you put it in water. It will literally explode or catch on fire if you throw it in water. Pure sodium metal. Chlorine gas. Very, very toxic gas. Uh, it was one of the first things used actually for chemical warfare. German soldiers, I believe, in World War I would put chlorine gas out across the battlefield, reacts with the oxygen, or sorry, the, reacts with the water in your eyes, forms hydrochloric acid, and you go blind. It also then gets into your lungs, reacts with the water in your lungs, forms hydrochloric acid there. Very, very bad scene. So two very distinct substances with very dangerous properties mix them together in a chemical reaction, 
form NaCl, sodium chloride. Throw it on your popcorn and watch the next Marvel movie. It's table salt. Very, very different properties. A chemical change has occurred to form something new with brand new properties. And with that, that is the end of our first video in this course uh, on matter and energy. Thank you.